This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Remarkable results, Radio Carm Capriato at the 2022 Napa Expo. And it's our this is our first interview in this gorgeous open air studio that we have. We never have a roof, Ron. We, we never have a roof. And when Ron came in here, he goes, wow, this almost sounds like it's a shop. It, it is the largest, most expensive shop. If you think about it, uh, you I, haven't seen my shop yet. No, I'm just <laughs> well, it better be nice. Yeah. It's nicer yeah. than this place right now. Yeah, I guess there's more cool things in this place if you're a, an auto enthusiast or a do-it-yourself. Or my gosh, everything, everything, everything you could ever want is in this building right now. I think I would have to introduce the voices that are speaking. <laughs> Everyone knows who I am. At least his. You don't need. Yeah, uh, I won't do you, man. Ron Caps is with us. Wow. NHRA footy car driver, the Napa car. The Napa car. Jeez. Love that. Yeah. Team owner. And a team yes. owner. We want to talk about that too. Uh you you just you just finished Colorado what yesterday? Yeah, last night. Last Flew night. In here. It actually worked out good being here with you guys in Napa Expo because we have a three race, three race what they call the Western Swing, and it's Denver, Sonoma, Seattle. And so 2020, obviously, we were going to have Napa Expo, and we were yeah. ready to come here and do that. And it was a different month and all, but uh, it got put off, and here we are. So we'll take it whenever we can get it, whether it's July. And it's what I, we landed last night. It was 108 here yesterday. I don't know about you guys, but uh, that's pretty warm. Yeah, I know. It's a dry heat. It was only 30% <laughs> humidity. Yikes. Sonoma. They make wine there. Yes, they do. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Yeah. Oh, I like a guy. I mean, we could drink some good cab together, couldn't we? Yeah. Hey, uh, Matt Fonslow is also with us from uh, Riverside Automotive out in Red Wing, Minnesota, and the Matt Fonslow Diagnosing the Aftermarket podcast. Nice to see you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. And Paul Mech is with us. It's Ron's manager. Hey, Paul. How are you? I'm great. Uh, thanks for putting this together for me. And uh, anything for a Buffalo, for a Buffalo, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. He's from my hometown time ago, but we talked about some of our favorite haunts back in the day chicken wings, yeah, we sure did talk about that. Ron, what does it take to in 2021 to start your own motorsports company? I mean, that's what we want to talk about. It, it sort of happened during the pandemic, and I've gotten to tell this story a few times, but all of our lives were changed during the pandemic sure. for one reason or another right yeah. and uh that moment where i really you know i've i've been driving since uh professionally since 1997 and i was driving for don the snake perdome one of my heroes growing up snake and the mongoose i played with her hot wheels so to be thrown into this rock star role of driving for a legend like that um, in a sport that i grew up in building his models and playing with his toys um was it, it was cool but what happened was throughout the years of being just a paid driver, a hired shoe or whatever you want to call it, um, I've always had the thought that someday, of course, the ultimate would be a team owner like a John Force, like a Connie yeah. Coletta, like a Dom Perdome yeah. um, and a Roger Pinsky. You know, you just go down the list of all these these great owners that have driven at one point or been into racing and now just the best of the best. So. I've had this long career, which has been great. It's been 27 years, I think, profession. I've been driving for different owners, went to Don Schumacher's, and that's when Napa Auto Parts came on board as a sponsor. And it was during the pandemic that I had one of those, oh my gosh, moments that I said, you know what, I'm gonna do this. It's now or never. And uh, and so when racing got going again after the pandemic, um, we slowly got going with an HRA. The, the company, Napa Auto Parts, Genuine Parts Company, had some new people come in. They were transitioning, moving a lot of things the way they, they looked at, at motorsports and athletics and things that they were doing. And there was just a fresh new vibe at the top there at headquarters in Atlanta. And at the same time, I was going to make that move. I didn't know what I was going to do, um, but things came together. I was hoping Napa would come on board in this venture, in this lifelong dream. And I didn't even know that I was going to have a budget or a sponsor at that time. We were searching for one. But I was just praying and hoping that they would stay on board with me. I'd been with them since 2008. And lo and behold, um, they said, we want to be part of this venture of yours. We want to be part of this dream and this this thing. Now, uh, you and I, we all talked before that we got on the air here. And it's it's really what helped that was a lot of me being around Napa Auto Care Centers, which are garages and shops that you see driving around the country that people own. 
And what people forget is Napa Auto Parts stores. It's not, it's not a chain. It's not something that uh, you can franchise. Most Napa Auto Parts stores are owned by people in your neighborhood. It's not, it's not Napa owned stores that are spread around. These are people that, that are living the lifelong dream, if you will, that being a, you know, a business owner, uh, taking control of your own life, but in the auto parts business. So between the auto care centers, which are an extension of Napa Auto Parts, and I, most of what we do away from the racetrack is I spend time at these appearances and these dinners and these events with Napa Auto Care people, which are hardworking mechanics, basically, during the day and technicians. Now, I grew up with a dad that was a technician for 33 years as a Chevrolet dealership. So every bit of my time on summers, I spent working as my dad's mechanical assistant, running parts. Uh, so I was around that lifestyle. And uh, so it was just natural for me. I just kind of gravitated. And I think that's what's made this sponsorship, if you will, so well is I really grew up in that world. So I understand how hard they work. I understand that, uh, you know, I even worked right out of high school. I went and, you know, you're trying to beat flat rate. You're working at a dealership. You're trying to make a living. Um, and so being around these people that had their own businesses as Napa Auto Care Centers and jobbers that are waking up in the morning, figuring out how to be better, how to make their business better, how to make their lives better, make more money. Um, I've had that to feed off of. So to answer your question, I I told the my team owner last year in September, we had about six races to go. And I said, I'm going to not come back next year. I didn't have a contract the following year and Napa wasn't coming back with him. Um, and I told him uh, right off the bat before I told anybody else that that's, that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to finally make that move. I never imagined that I would have the backing like Napa stepped up and did because it's uh, for me, you know, as a race car driver, I dreamt even before I had them as a sponsor. I, I always just saw commercials they did. I saw the, how involved they were. And um, I grew up with my grandfather who, uh, who worked on a lot of cars going down and picking up parts for him as a little kid. And he had an account at the local Napa auto parts store in a little town I grew up in. So I was just around that. And it, and it just, it was, I always said, man, that would be the ultimate sponsor. If you could have one, gosh, I mean, how much better could it get? And then I had it. And then they decided to come along in this, you know, not knowing what, how I was going to do, what I was going to do and how it was going to go, but they wanted to be a part of it. And it's, it gets emotional sometimes because you, you, you know, you hope that something like that happens. You just never imagined it. it. It reminds me that you didn't even have a plan B. No. Well, you know, what I did figure was uh, I was surrounded by enough good people up to that point. But I figured, worst case, if I want a couple more. Now, we had our playoffs. We had a six-race playoffs, which, by the way, this is all going on in the back, all this white noise. And we're fighting for a world championship, which we ended up winning. So now you take it a step further. You you could not have scripted a Hollywood story better yeah, 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 yeah. than all this going on in the background, fighting for a world championship, winning a world championship, and then announcing that you're going to be a team owner the next year, yeah. and you're going to have the backing of one of the best sponsors in the world. Yeah. It was just it was crazy how things planned out. But I figured if I couldn't get a sponsor, when I first decided I was going to do it, I could always somebody was going to I hopefully was going to pay me to drive. I, I could get. Even last minute, I figured I would get a ride doing something to make enough money to get by. I, I had done it long enough. And I, I think I'm a decent driver, and, and I represent sponsors enough that I think I could have probably got. Now, who knows? And I'm glad I never had to find out, but uh, that was my plan B. <laughs> plan C was go to work at an Apple Auto Parts store <laughs> and, and be oh, yeah. a parts, oh, yeah, parts yeah. person, yeah. delivery person. Oh, yeah, that would have happened. <laughs> the yeah. fast Drive that truck around truck with a yellow hat on top. <laughs> well, you are the fastest delivery yeah, can we, yeah. can yeah. we get a delivery truck with a V8? Because this four <laughs> is just not going to hack yeah. It's no secret we're facing a technician shortage. Napa Auto Care has a solution with the Napa Auto Care Apprentice Program. The program was engineered by one of our own. Pete McNeil and Master Technician Jake Sorensen of McNeil's Auto Care in Sandy, Utah, realized that the problem of not having technicians available for hire was not going to solve itself and decided to take action and look at a different audience of individuals available for hire. A focus was put on younger individuals with the right passion, desire, and attitude to work in the automotive repair industry. Jake and Pete sought these individuals and developed a technician apprentice program to give them the training needed to become a successful technician in today's world. 
The Napa Auto Care Apprentice Program includes a comprehensive nine-stage curriculum that includes a variety of types of training, classroom training videos. Exclusive to the Apprentice Program, these videos provide an in-depth training from a successful master technician. Auto Tech classes, instructor-led courses offered through Napa Auto Tech. Auto Tech e-learning, web-based e-learnings designed to target specific training topics. Hands-on learning. The apprentice will apply the skills gained from the classroom training videos, Autotech instructor-led training, and Autotech e-learnings in the shop with the guidance of a mentor. The apprentice program curriculum is competency-based, meaning an apprentice can move through each stage at a pace that best suits them. Most apprentices complete the program within two years. Upon a completion, apprentices will have earned ASE G1, A4, A5, and AC certifications adding industry validation to the skills an apprentice acquires. Grow your bottom line. Having an apprentice in your shop will ultimately benefit your bottom line as they advance through the program. In most cases, as the apprentice develops their skill set producing billable hours, you will begin to see a growth in your gross profit by stage five. Keep your apprentice motivated with an apprentice toolkit. One of the largest entry barriers for individuals looking to enter the automotive repair industry is the cost of tools. Napa Auto Care has worked with our supplying partners to offer an exclusive, comprehensive tool set, including a four-drawer tool cart for all registered apprentices. To learn more, members can visit member.napaautocare.com. I love your story. It's inspiring. Thank you for sharing it. I also read in your bio that you, your mom was carrying you uh, when she, when the family went to the races, I mean, it was it, yeah. ever since uh, minute, minute one, huh? Well, my, you know, there was always Shirley Cha-Cha Muldowney, right? And, but I had my own mom to me it was Shirley Muldowney growing up. She raced, my dad would put her in race cars. He got more thrill out of building a race car. He was the guy that everybody came to in town. You know, we had a drag strip there. When he sold his race car, he was the guy that my garage was always full of people bringing their race cars over because he was that guy, right? He, he knew how to help people with injection or superchargers or motors, whatever it might be. So it was cool to have that atmosphere around. But my he got more, he just dug it more, building a race car and sticking my four foot, eight foot mom, she's Portuguese, and she would rip your heart out the starting line at a drag strip. Like she was brutal, right? What do you mean? What do you mean? I mean, reaction time and just oh. and and before oh. that back in the day when they met and they were running around town like you know american graffiti style my dad <laughs> my dad's street cars back in the day when they would go outside of town and run on a little two-lane strip of road he would put her in his fast street cars and they'd go out and bet money and beat guys and oh, guys no. yeah so she had this reputation that she just didn't mess with them and she you know four speed they'd put blocks of two by fours on the pedal so she could reach and he had a 55 <laughs> chevy with a big block and I've heard all these stories, so um, I, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. I was, I was probably, um, well, I'm sure that I was conceived at a drag strip somewhere in a parking lot, and for sure I was in her belly. I'm sure um, at a drag strip while she was driving at one point or another. I I tell a story like that, and I won't now. But uh, <laughs> I I think something like that could have happened. Because seems not a bad word, right? Yeah. No, it's a good I, word. I, I kept it clean. No, you you did, but uh, Tracy you know. got nervous over there at the board. I can see. <laughs> um, I'll keep it G-rated. Yeah, you know, Grace has been good to nap. Yeah, it really has. I mean, I I'm I'm just super excited and happy that they said let's do this. Yeah. It, Again, you know, from afar, watching Michael Waltrip commercial, Dale Jr. and Sammy Hagar, just all the fun they used to have making fun of themselves, all the fun commercials. I used to just, in, I was so much envy in me of how great a sponsor they were. But yeah. you go back to, you know, they've been around forever. So it. Um, Tell us your Napa know-how story about the little old lady. Uh, that was at the Denver airport. I was changing planes um, and I was on one of those moving walkways. Oh, okay. And uh, I had a Napa shirt on, of course, and we're going opposite directions. And uh, I'll never forget it. It's just this old. She saw the Napa, you know, from afar. It's very visible, you know, logo, of yeah. course. And she saw it, and as she went by, she started doing the Napa know-how thing to me, <laughs> and shaking her head. And she and we just kept going opposite ways. I thought that was the most bizarre moment. Uh, so she obviously saw the commercials, which was cool. <laughs> So let's talk about starting your yeah. uh, your company and uh, in having to be now the leader of it. Uh, it's not a risk, but it, during your whole think period during COVID, I got to do this. And, uh, you know, 
what's the upside, what's the downsize, and pulling a team together. I think we struggle in our industry trying to find great technicians and train them constantly and worry about productivity, satisfying customers. There's a story here on what I think our industry can learn from what you've done. Well, it kind of it really started the other way around, but it's amazing how many people throughout this season already. So every race we've gone to, it's my first at being an owner. First of all, it's, seen, it's first it's seen a lot of our fans in each area we go to. But a lot of these Napa events, um, it never fails. Even last weekend in Denver race, and um, I get these fans that come up, and almost every one of them will shake my hand. You know, I'll sign something for them, and I'll shake my hand, and they'll say, we are so happy and excited for you and on you being a team owner. So the fans have really felt like they're a part of it, which they should be. You know, they, they really ha should. Uh, but it's amazing how many people, I mean, there's people that come up in both hands, grab my hand, and, you know, fans, and just look me in the eye and say, well, we're so, so happy that you're a team owner now. We're so excited for you. And that's pretty cool to be at the racetrack and have fans do that. And then you take it a step further, all these events we're doing, these Napa people, um, walking in here, I probably got stopped 10 times on the way in by different Napa people. Some I didn't even know who they were. They yell my name and we're excited for you, happy for you. And, you know, as we're going, walking through here. So it, it's just been a lot of fun, but it really kind of started the other way around where I've always been intrigued with being around the Napa people um, and hearing their stories. A lot of them, uh, especially Napa Auto Cares and the shops. And again, I kind of grew up in that world, but I, I've always... I've always loved our events where we, you know, we may have a dinner and have some beers and just hang out. And these people work their tails off all day, right? And uh, it may be leading into a race. So they get to come out and hang out with Ron Caps, the race car driver. But me, they show up and they're still dirty. They smell like diesel. But we're having a beer and we're, we're celebrating really them working hard. And that's what helps me with my sponsorship, right? And so I love hearing their stories. You know, some of them, it's fifth generation family passed down some of these jobbers that, that are store owners for people listening at home a jobber is a store owner yeah so um they've always called i'm not sure that we call them jobbers not anymore. i need to learn not that anymore <laughs> um but these store owners are are the same thing um we checked in last night here to the hotel and a kid and his uh wife young came up and said how happy i was and uh he was that i am out on my own and being a team owner and that he did the same thing with two napa stores in their little town in illinois somewhere and he, he proceeded to tell me his story and how excited it was. So, I mean, we've had these moments, right? Um, so for me, it's always been listening to their stories. How are they making it, right? You know, you have a couple of beers with somebody that's maybe uh, had a dad that started a shop. And, of course, you know, they wanted to survive. You know, it's being passed down. Maybe their, their dad's around. And you hear these stories of dads or grandpas that still pop in that are 90 years old that started it and they may come in and drive and deliver parts or something. Um, so I've always fed to answer your question. I've always fed off of that part. And now I've got these people talking to me about, about my role in being a team owner, but honest to God, I just tell them like, Oh, it's really, I'm kind of seat of the pants and I'm, go, I'm going off of what I've learned being around the Napa people. And that's plain and simple. First thing I did was hire the best crew chief and crew members that I, that I, could and which was the team that i got put together with last year and we won a world championship together the first time ever uh, racing together okay so that right. team that had that magic with you yeah came well, with you my longtime crew chief retired in january of 2021 oh. right before the season started 11th hour my team owner we had another driver didn't have funding well my team owner put me together with that other team that didn't have the driver I obviously I lost my crew chief and my team because my crew chief retired and my my old team I had for eight or nine years together didn't want to work for another crew chief. So they all went to work elsewhere. So I got put together with these guys. A lot of my knew already just never had worked together. And we proceeded to win a world championship together the first year. So back to when you asked me about going out on my own that September when I told my team owner I wasn't coming back. Um, this crew chief and this team that we won the world championship had a lot of money thrown at them to go elsewhere. They could have very well gone and probably made more money. Not that I'm not paying them well, but there's a lot of independently wealthy racers out there that will throw a carrot out there to a lot of, of good crew members and, and crew chiefs. And they all came, my whole team came with me on this venture. And I, this is a guy going out on his own the first time as a team owner. So 
that was pretty cool for me. They all said, we want to be part of what you're doing. You know, I got to stop you for a bit, Matt, and, and I want to bring a parallel to the shops that are throwing all kinds of money at technicians because they're shorthanded. But it's the culture that people want to work for. They want to work for someone who cares about them, appreciates them, wants to train them. And I can only think that the reason this crew came for you and they could have gotten more money is they believed in you and you appreciated them. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd like to think so. I, I felt the same way about them, and I grew up a crew member, so I know what that part of life is about, traveling down the road. I always wanted to be a driver, but I, I, I lived that part of it. So, yeah, that that was huge. But I understood driving for Don Perdome and being around these people. I paid a lot of attention over the years. You know, Don Perdome would always say, you can't win the Kentucky Derby riding a mule. And I always knew what he meant. And you've got to have a good team. you got to have a good car. I don't care if you're John Force. If you're not going to be John Force, if you've got a 10th place car, you're going to be 10th place John Force, right? You're not going to be umpteenth world champion John Force. So you've got to have that. And I, that was the very first thing. Well, actually, first thing was to hire Paul Mecca uh, right here, who was uh, him and I worked together with Nap Auto Parts for several years, uh, eight or nine years together in the Napa system. And so he was the first hire as our team manager. We We've been together and want to stay together, but the team was the first thing really we locked in. And since then, man, I, it, uh, it's the best thing I could have done ever. Now this year, we brought I brought the team out to a lot of our events with these Napa get-togethers. And I find myself, a lot of these auto care people, and it, they're gravitating towards my crew. And I look over, and they're over at another table talking, a, a, a technician talking to my crew guys and enjoying themselves rather than talking to me, which is fine by me. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And then you might have a shop owner over there talking to, to Guido is my crew chief's name. He's got a nickname named Guido. Um, and it's really cool because those, they're eye to eye. They, they are so many. It's just fun to watch because, the, like you said, the parallels to our race team and a shop are so alike. It's not even funny. You've got to have a good manager, right? You've got to have a team. If you're going to own the place, you not only have to have a good manager, but you if you don't have a manager, you've got to manage well. And a lot of times you've got to let a good technician do their work. And that's that's what's key. Well, Ron and just said something so important. And he says, remember when he was a crew member. And when we think about some of the struggles we have in our industry and our shop owners today that were, were a technician, they just loved to fix cars and now they have to run a business. Maybe that's one of the secrets that's missing with the struggling shops is remember when you used to work in those bays and the challenges and how hard that job really is. You didn't just get handed the keys to this and open the door and here's the team and let's go win. You let people do what they needed to do or your manager let people do their jobs because they're really good at it. And that I think that's really important. So that's, that's cultural. You have a team culture. We would say a shop culture. Yeah. And you have clearly you know, the manager or yourself or whoever you have uh, operating procedures that they follow and maybe help develop so that they're more likely to follow them. And all of that contributes to world championships. Like that stuff doesn't fall into place. It's just like you're saying, you can't, you can't win if somebody, somebody doesn't do their job the way they could, the team doesn't win. It can't. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're saying is just it really resonates with me. And I think it should resonate with a lot of uh, just shops and techs are, um, in general that, hey, there's got to be a team goal. You know, and we're not competing against other shops to win. Right. It's not a zero sum game, but we're trying to be successful. We're trying to feed our families. We're trying to grow our business, buy new equipment, maintain old equipment, market you know, fund a marketing campaign to bring in more customers, stuff like that. Well, that's winning. That's the goal. Everybody's got to buy into that team goal and how we're going to get there and help develop the way to get there. And I mean, just what you're saying over and over has been resonating with me. Ron, you know, you've said before you trust the guys. And for example, you they build a brand new race car. You get in it, you go make a full pull. You don't worry about a thing. You trust what they've done. Yeah, that's a wonderful, yeah. that's a good statement. Yeah. That's a yeah. really good Let statement. Let them do their work. Yeah. yeah. I'm smart enough to know I'm not good at something. I need to have somebody good around, you know, and let them do it. You know, hiring Paul, of course, and, and the team. And then through uh, the off season, 
uh, I was a mess for a couple months because I was trying to learn what I needed business wise. So now I'm telling my son, go to business, go because he's right now he's starting college and he doesn't know what he wants to do as far as a major, which is great. I told him, don't rush because that could get expensive. Right. <laughs> but I said, business major. It used to when we were growing up, it was the party major because it was one of the <laughs> easiest. Right. You just go and business and you learn and, and the classes weren't completely killer. They just didn't worry out. But it was. But now if you I told him, go get a business degree, just a basic even so that if you ever decide no matter what you do in life, because had I taken one, oh, my gosh, the offseason would have been a little better for me. But I had a crash course in everything business. So a lot of the people that have started these shops and all that, oh my gosh, I, I've heard the stories and I and I now I feel them because they tell me that, you know, I, I, there's a couple in um, in North Carolina we race out there and they've come out a few times. This couple, I forget what it was, they they moved from somewhere up in Wisconsin or somewhere. They moved down on a whim, bought a Napa Auto Parts. No, it's an auto care center. Yeah. They actually stay in a camper in the back of this place. So I, I've, we've seen them three times. We were twice in, in North Carolina. We were a four wide race and we go back in a playoff race. And we saw them again this last year. But the year before, they were, they had one other tech and they moved all that way and they were living in a camper in the back of the shop. And from what I gathered, he was a pretty good technician, obviously. Yeah. And she was pretty good at, at helping or whatever she did. But she, she would, they made a good team you could tell and we were at like a top golf event the first time and maybe a, a dinner another time and we just saw them at a top golf thing we did a couple months ago and they finally moved into a house they were finally up and running well enough but they were just the stories they were telling i was like i i feel you i know now i know what you're talking about i just went through it and so they they it was so neat because they could just see the relief yeah. that they had finally a place that they could leave the shop at night and drive to a house and actually be away from it, that it was running, but I, they struggled, you know, for a, a couple of years. And I would see that every few months when we would see them. So it was cool. Those stories are great with me, but yeah, it's uh love, love your energy, love yeah. your excitement. Take us behind the scenes. What do you guys do the night before have a big ribeye dinner get together have a meeting do you well it do depends you, almost always there's some type of a, a sponsor event usually on okay. a thursday night and right. most of the time with napa listen i i'm very blessed if you follow me on social media and i'm usually posting where these appearances i go to and i spend not a lot of time at home but in between races doing appearances wherever i get asked to go but most always we have something on a thursday night because we start qualifying on friday so um, usually a Napa distribution center in that particular area will put together an event and either somebody has to qualify for it or they get invited to it if they're a very good customer, they buy a certain amount of parts. And, and it could be an indoor go-karting thing we did in Denver where they had 60 people come uh, after work and most of them were technicians. They got to come race with me at an indoor go-karting place and then some beers afterwards and just hang out and just, you know, because it, at the racetrack, we don't get to get that one-on-one -on -one time a lot of top golf events well they'll they'll come in and rent out a bunch of bays if you've been to one of those they're a blast oh yeah um dinners nice a good steak dinner that you know they get off on a thursday but it, night but is your crew with you now they get invited more okay. more so this year uh, before we might have a crew chief invited to come to an okay. event it just depended on how many were how many yeses they got yeah. and their invites and how much room they have but I'm finding more and more this year it's unique and I'm not even sure how it happened, but all of a sudden our crew guys are been invited almost every week, which has been, and I, I think maybe because we have this new ownership thing and I, I don't know, it's been fun though. And my guys are so appreciated of, of being able to join us for these events because my old crew never got to go to a lot of them and very rare, but almost everywhere this year, which now, now, I'm, now I'm telling you this, it's kind of unique because it's, it's been almost every race. So there's something there, but um, it's nice to, to, to have them join. And again, just uh, every time they came out the other night and there they were technicians off talking yeah, yeah. shop with my guys because they're blown away. They're, they're telling them the size of the bore of our pistons yep. and they're blown away by the stroke and the size of the length of our rods or right. well, uh, the number of fuel injectors. Yeah. Or telling them, uh, you know, what we do between runs to actually talk to a guy that actually they could talk to me. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going to tell them, there's what we do. We do this and fuel is $40 a gallon. And I give them the whole spiel. Right. 
they're actually talking to the, one of the kids because we've got eight kids, eight guys that attack this engine. And, and in 33 minutes, they will have it apart, raging hot from a run, completely apart, back together in 35 minutes and ready to fire back up. 11,000 horsepower. Yeah. 30, you can't get your oil changed in 33 minutes, right? These guys tear this engine down to the bare block. Nothing but the block and the crankshaft. Everything completely out of the clutch off the back and back together. So a technician, a gearhead, that is the ultimate. I mean, that is that's that's car porn, right? I mean, to hear to for them to <laughs> yep. sorry, Tracy. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna okay. I've got con, I've got conceived and okay. So um, <laughs> wait a minute. We should do a show on car porn. Yeah. That is yeah. see. Okay. There's I'm not your, afraid to talk show, about right? that. I love the whole concept in 33 minutes from soup to nuts, open heart surgery on the vehicle. It, what kind of things can go wrong? A lot. Yeah. Anytime you're pouring nitromethane into the tank, even if it's per just completely perfect and put together perfect, it's a, one of the most volatile fuels in the world. And it basically, that engine sitting there, if you run gas in it, it might be a 1,000, 1,500 max horsepower. But when you pour nitromethane in it, we're talking 12,000 horsepower. It's just shy of 12,000 horsepower that they're making now. And this is an internal combustion engine that's basically... You know, an eight cylinder, you know, supercharged engine. It's 11, over 11,000 horsepower. It's crazy. 15, 1600 horsepower per cylinder. So one cylinder on my car is more than Chase Elliott's NASCAR car over there. Imagine that. We, one we, cylinder. We would have a whole nother podcast if we got into the physics of what's going on with nitromethane. So to answer your question, when nitro's in it, it is very volatile if you don't have a good crew chief that knows what he's doing it can become a bomb very quickly and they do those those are those highlights that i'm in uh, and other drivers are in a lot of explosions so um so things can happen stuff happens <laughs> with nitros put in it but when it's good and it's right oh man <laughs> well take it one take it one step further what you're saying is true but now you blow up an engine so you've got the rebuild, but you've got to change a block. Maybe you've got to rewire some some part of the car. You've got to clean all your oil lines out, your fuel lines out. That add that. I mean, he's, blow, he's blowing, blowing the engine during the run. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you've got a fire going on there, right? Yeah. In fact, you know, a few races ago, we won our second race of the season in Bristol, and we completely exploded right at the finish line, 330 miles an hour, exploded. Uh, it dropped the cylinder and and got an intake valve and when it does that with a nitro engine it's big time and it was it's a bomb um and luckily we had some teammates uh that came over and helped our crew but got us back the starting line because we're on live tv and uh, we went on to win the race had a backup body that we brought out the toyota super body and put that on there we made it within minutes back up to to race who is now the number one in the points car and beat him the wow. next run and then went on to win the whole race um, and it did. It had a fire and burned a bunch of lines, like he said. Yeah. And, and so it wasn't just rebuilding the car. It was quite a bit more. But uh, I think they gave us 50 minutes to be back up there because it was live TV. So those are those cool moments that you look back and you go, man, that was that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Can we talk about speed? I that, know, that yeah. means going fast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> back when you started. Because uh, you just mentioned 330 miles an hour. I don't know what the land speed record is on the salt flats. Oh, I mean, it's, it's they broke the uh, sound barrier. So okay, all right. Yeah. So okay, but 330 in 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 the track. Uh, and when you first started, what was the speed those those cars were going? When I started driving, yeah. When I started driving, there was there was a 300 mile an hour club. Uh, wow. in Top Fuel and Funny Car. And I came in right near the end of that. Kenny Bernstein had just gone 300, first to go 300, um, maybe five years, because I started in Top Fuel Dragster one year, my rookie year, and then I got in, Don Pernome hired me in a Funny Car. Been in a Funny Car since. But when I was in the Dragster, Kenny Bernstein had made the first 300 mile an hour run, and then we had, there was a club started, and there was only 16 members gonna be. So it went pretty quick. People started picking up on his speed, and. And uh, and that, that filled up pretty quick. Yeah. Funny Car had a, a 300 mile an hour club as well, which I got into my rookie year at one point. And they also had a four second club. But the speed um, was right around 95, 96 ish. The most cars were starting to go 300 plus okay. in a quarter mile. Now, since then, we're we run to a thousand foot since 
we had the death of a, a funny a fellow funny car driver um they shortened the tracks up to have give us more shutdown area but at the quarter mile kenny bernstein was the first to do that and um and then it just all of a sudden it opened the floodgates yeah i think that's the important part is the the 300 is amazing 330 is amazing what makes it amazing is the distance that they achieve it yeah. and the amount of time that's the acceleration that's what we're talking about i think for wheeled vehicles it's top fuel and funny car are by far the uh, hardest accelerating things on the planet oh and then maybe, there's only one thing more g forces <clears throat> well we go higher g forces than space shuttle the fighter pilot you know eight eight or nine g's well when they're pulling g's yeah, yeah during okay. the run um but yeah for sure and yeah for sure on the planet those two well we're zero to 100 imagine this so right now our car will go zero to 100 miles an hour in w less than one second yep. which is the amazing part but it's really about seven tenths of a second and it happens in 60 feet from a standing stop yep so imagine in 60 feet if you and i are looking out that's the back of this truck over here yeah from a standing stop we're going 100 miles an hour so it's literally being shot out of a cannon um and that is what the amazing thing is when you drive them i mean yeah. it's just cool when you see the numbers but when you're driving them and the g-forces actually aren't at the very step you'd imagine that would be the highest g's no. it's actually about a second and a half in when the clutch starts applying and then it and then just the, pins the tires you. are oh yeah and it just it's like the, the battlestar galactica show when it first came <laughs> out and that hyperspace thing <laughs> it's exactly what it so feels you really like. have gone plaid yeah oh yeah <laughs> we invented plaid yeah because they're they break about the uh tesla plaid will do it's more kind of a rolling uh zero to 100 i think or zero to 60 in two seconds yeah and they're doing zero to 100 standing stop in 0. 0.7 0. 0.8 seconds consistently so do you pull a lot of data is there is your computer data between that 33 minute fix is somebody looking at oh, the yeah. data yeah, yeah. And, and what kind of adjustments are you making they have you can really look at as much as you want on these computers but it, it's not something like formula one where it's actively nor and really, if you look at it, 3.8 seconds, there's not much you could do. It, you know, we're not allowed to have traffic control or anything like that. So they really couldn't do anything um, real time. But what happens is that we make a run, they come back, they upload it into a little a little box, they take it into the computer and they download it in the computer and they can look at cylinder temperatures, they look at a G meter, they look, we have infrared uh, ride heights that will tell them when the tires started to grow, uh, fuel, pump pressures they'll have gallons per minute so they can see if a pump's going down you could go on and on and on it's got a g meter in it so it'll tell exactly when the g started pulling and how much and they can overlay different runs so what they do is they'll look at that data and then they make an educated guess because let's say we're going to run two runs uh, on a on a saturday 12 o'clock and three o'clock is our qualifying runs well they've got a sort of guess and off the weather system and what they think the weather will be like what the track temperature will be like in an hour from now because by the time we start the car go down the staging lanes and get ready and i get suited up and get in it it's been that long so they have to kind of guess what the weather will be like and guess what that tune-up is and how much they think they can apply the power in the clutch sometimes they get it sometimes they don't and then of course they make the run come back and look at that run and overlay it to what they think and so they get all this data every run and they can pull up at the last weekend they were pulling up runs from three or four years ago and comparing things and trying to figure things out is the computer doing some work on that car i mean are you just putting your foot to the pedal and yeah i i uh i have a big gas pedal i have a handbrake i've got a clutch but basically a clutch is for me to roll forward do the burnout put it in reverse and back up and that's it i don't even i don't pop the clutch like a normal car it's a centrifugal clutch so i have a handbrake i hold it with and uh, I have a fuel pump lever that I pull on. And when that light comes down, there's flash of, of yellows and, that you see on the Christmas tree. And I mash the pedal. And at the, at the very bottom of that pedal, there's a red button underneath it. And when that button goes down, it starts all the timers and everything that they can set for that run. So basically, they're setting a run up from the step of the throttle. And so... When I hit the gas, that button starts everything. So when they test their system and they do a test run, let's say in the pit area, he will go in and he has a, a guy reach his fingers underneath and hit the button in the pit area. And it starts all those timers and he has a little box he can plug in and it downloads that, that test yeah, run, yeah, if you yeah, will. Yep. Then he'll go plug in the computer like it's supposedly a run and he can see what the timers would do. Then they hope and pray 
when we go down the, the track. Now, again, they can make little changes before I get on the track. Last minute little changes like here and there. Like what? Well, they can move a timer. They can pop the box open and maybe stretch a clutch, a, a valve out that's going to add clutch at, let's say, 2.2 seconds or 2.6 seconds. If the track got hotter, we don't need this clutch right here. We're going to slide the clutch a little more, so they're going to move a couple timers out. And I'm talking fractions of a second, believe it or not. So little things like that, they can change at the last minute. And they often do. If you watch the TV shows, you'll see a crew chief run back and get in this big box and start wiggling his arms around while he's moving timers around. And then we now, instead of the magnetos, uh, we finally went electronic. So these MSDs, really? we, we can map, um, you can map the ignition timing before the run. So they will have, let's say it's got 60 degrees of timing and because about a second and a half is a transition for these tires to either hook up or come loose or shake with all that power. They actually have a map they can plug into these magnetos. We have two, two magnetos on them that will take 20 degrees out at 1.2 seconds and get through that tough spot and then add timing and add like 25 or 30 degrees after that and start adding fuel to it. And so they've got all these different things that have really changed the sport here lately that uh, mechanically have changed in the sport of drag racing. So I heard you have your hands are on two levers. Uh, who holds the steering wheel? Well, I, I make sure I have <laughs> the steering wheel yeah. leg. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a yeah, lot. You got a coffee in the morning and you're trying to ship. And you're, that's me. Exactly. But right. I do leave with one hand on the brake and one on the wheel. And then once I let go of that handbrake, I reach over and grab the wheel. Uh, the, the technology stuff you're talking about just speaks I, that's right up my alley. That's the stuff I care about. What's going on and how to, you know, the physics of it and then what to do to make the physics work in your favor to get you down the track the fa faster. That's that's the stuff that I could just if listen fans to knew, all day. If fans knew how much, and I, I love, I wish they would do more mechanical pieces on the TV shows, and it, they're, they're getting better at it. But if, if people knew how much has to go right like I'm just telling you some of the adjustments. If you look, when you guys come to a race, I'll show you this box and you'll be blown away by the little timers and the clutch. And every time you add clutch with a nitro engine, the nitro methane loves to be loaded. It has to be put under pressure. So if you move a clutch timer to, to add to the run to add clutch, you better add fuel right away or you're gonna drop a cylinder and vice versa. If you, if you don't add clutch and you add fuel, it could put a cylinder out. If you do it backwards, it could go lean and blow up. So, and we're talking fractions of a second. So there's there's a whole there's a plethora of stuff that has to go right for this car to go down the track. One of those little timers off fractions of a second. I mean, one of those timers, one of the 30 something timers off a little bit. It doesn't make it. So all that time spent putting the engine together and the car together and the, all the man hours, hundreds of hours getting to the track and setting up and one little thing off where the driver messes up, the runs aborted and you lose everything. So the magic in the crew chief and all of your people is in these fine adjustments. Yeah. And, and of course, making sure you've got you know, every part backed up of high quality inspected. You you've, I can't imagine the inventory you guys carry. Yeah, we, we, we do some pit tours sometimes with some of our guests. And, um, you know, you'll pop open a cabinet and there's a short block sitting there ready to run. And you're talking forty-five thousand dollars for a short yeah. block sitting there, and wow. and there and we might have five or six of them lined up under these cabinets, <laughs> which is nuts. And a rear end is twenty-five thousand yeah. dollars, you know. So so let's think about the man starts his own motorsports company and hear the numbers he's talking. I mean, it, it takes some coin to get he had started. A, he had a platinum card. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. the, the amount of dollars I've seen go in and out of my checking account is something I never imagined ever that I would see in my lifetime. You know, and it's just amazes me because it's just just cubic dollars that, that yeah. race. And it's just it, it's it's mind boggling to see, you know, somebody will say, oh, you blew up that body. How much did it cost to repair it? And or, or, or what I'm learning, the funniest part is a washer or a nut, you know, that I used to take for granted. I see it in the pit area when I was a paid driver and I walk by and kick it under the trailer, you know. Yeah. That that is like a thirty-five dollar little washer sure. or some for some reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when I found out, I'm like, oh my god, I'm running around picking them up now. And I see them in other people's pit areas. And I'm picking them up. I'm like a you know a, a, a 
scavenger. A homeless yeah. guy running around picking other people's stuff. Yeah, if up they're there magnetic, there. you could just get one of those roller magnets and just <laughs> yeah. run up and down. <laughs> right? Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're still. You're not signing the checks, are you? Yes. Well, my wife is actually. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she got very involved too. That was another cool thing is she did our taxes before when I was just a driver, but it was just an LLC we had. And now she is, you know, she works with Paul and we, she's doing invoices. She's checking everything. She learned how to everything in one month. She learned everything she could learn about uh, insurance, uh, liability insurance. I mean, we were on a crash wow. course together and this, that was another cool thing, which, you know, again, we run into these shop owners that have wives that are very involved and it's the same thing. My wife has taken on and she loves it. She's having a blast with it. And uh, so, yeah, she's got very, we, we've been trying to help each other out that way. And yeah, glad to hear her. I, mean, I like that he brought that up again. He said that earlier crash course on how to run the team or, or, or be an owner. And I wish that that would happen more often in our world where I do think, like you're saying, they like fixing cars. They were good at fixing cars. They had people that brought their cars specifically to them. Okay, I'm going to get this building, open the door, throw a shingle up. Here we go. And if I just keep fixing cars, I'm going to make money and succeed. And they don't go get the crash course. And I, I, you've said Listen, it twice now, and I, I really like that. There's somebody listening out there, I guarantee right now. And I'm telling you listening, you, whoever this is listening, you can do it. I, and I know that you look around and you're working for somebody and you're like, man, you know, that that person's got a boat and they're going out and spending time with their family. You can do you can you can do it. If I can do it, you can go start your own shop. And if you're a good person and a good technician, you're going to have people coming to you to get their work. You know, it's like having a good doctor wherever you live. You, you get, that's it's so hard especially if somebody moves, you want a good family doctor or somebody, right? I mean, somebody you can trust that you can call last minute and try to get in. It's so important. It's that same thing. We were just at UTI doing uh, the uh, technician school out there. And the uh, it, it's crazy if you think five years from now, the college degrees I don't think are going to be a big deal. I think these technicians and these mechanics and the people that are going through these schools we're right now, yeah. they're going to be the kings. They're going to be the ones with the boats on the weekends. They're going to be because they're going to be sought after to take care of all of our cars. You know, they're yep. out in the road. So we, we do a lot of stuff on the podcast about getting out and speaking to uh, middle school, high school, counselors, principals, superintendents, shadowing and getting our youth involved in skilled trades. Now, it could be carpenter. Carpenter could be listening to this and says, listen, I should go out and talk to a school. We need carpenters. We need plumbers. We need, but automotive, I, I kid a lot. I kid Matt a lot about if you want to wear a, a, a white lab coat and carry a computer around, become an automotive technician. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking computers and computers and data and, and, and slicing time and all that stuff. You know, Matt's a geek. He loves that stuff. And you're, and you're right. We have to do more as an industry, and thank you for being such a great champion of this and, and maybe motivating 10 people that listen to this and says, you know, I've heard Carm talk so much about getting out and speaking to our young people. Uh, I bet you, you never miss a chance to do that. No, I love it. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, I was, I was I lost know. after high school, wasn't sure what I was going to do, and I went to a, a technical school yeah. for uh, electronic engineering back then, and, and uh, it changed my life. But, yeah, that's... Yeah, for sure. We love doing that. Hey, look, at, I so appreciate you being here, but I have one final thought. Maybe you do too, Matt. And the words adrenaline, how do you deal with it when you're going that fast? You, you, I, don't, I don't know that you can deal with it. You just, you, it, it's such a great thing. It, you're strapped in with 12 different straps holding neck and arms, and then you're, you're, you're shot out of a cannon. Uh, and then you pop out of the top of this car at the top end and the camera's in your face and then they want you to, to talk. Yeah. So you, you try to you try to keep everything together. And, you know, you've seen John Force interviews and he just goes crazy. And that's because of that adrenaline. So it's, it's a matter of trying to to control the adrenaline after the run. But most of the times in a funny car, because and I joke, but it's not really I, I know where you live. It's probably the same thing that you, you're on one of those commuter flights coming into the small airport. Yeah. Right. And it's in weather 
and it's swaying around and moving around and somebody's getting sick in the row next to you and it's crazy and you're like oh man and they land that thing and you want to get out and kiss the ground that's right that is every run i make in a funny car <laughs> like literally very few times oh. do i make it where it's just blast on down there and you go oh that was fun most of the time it's like ah, you know you're fighting this thing all the way down and then you hit the shoots and it's negative eight g's by the way when you hit the parachutes so you have the positive g's shot out of a cannon and then negative eight or nine G's all in that amount of time. Uh, so the adrenaline is spiked out of your head to answer your question. It's wow. unbelievable. So, wow. Yeah. Well, you, you've often said you don't have time to enjoy the run. Yeah, you don't enjoy the run. The <laughs> wow. actual run, yeah. you don't. It's yeah. afterwards you go, man, that was cool. That was it. So thank you, Napa, for, uh, for getting you here in this beautiful studio they built for me. Paul Mecca, thank you for making sure that... Uh, Mr. Caps showed up. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. Uh, always good. Ron Caps, thank you. Continued success. And I know you got to go out and sign a whole bunch of stuff now, right? Yeah. I got the best you get teammates carpal in the world. tunnel from that? Is that uh, like a big I, I, problem? Luckily, I got a short name. I got to thank my, my mom and dad. So I am, it's not like I've got Richard Petty. You know, every autograph Richard Petty does, it's like a 20 second autograph. It's amazing to watch them. But mine's nice and short. Just yeah. whip it right out. Okay, it was good for you. Thanks for being here. You bet. Thank you.